Hey, um, raise your hand. Okay, you you'll participate. Raise your, hand. raise your hand if you play fantasy football. Raise your hand if you play fantasy football. What a hopeless nightmare that place is. <laughs> what is it about that thing? I don't know if you've never played fantasy football. You don't even know what it is. It's a group of adults trying to act as general managers against their friends. Usually it's just a way to, like, give your friends money because you never actually win. Never actually win. And so here I am every Sunday, every weekend, every Thursday night. I'm putting my roster together. And I look at my roster every single week and I think, what a bunch of hopeless losers I have. <laughs> if you play fantasy football, you know exactly. And so then I go to this thing called the waiver wire, known as the free agents. And I like them less than the guys I have, but I have to put some of them on my roster, right? You know what this feels like? There's just like a hopeless moment that I go through every week just so that I can give my friends money. You know what I'm talking about. It's like it, it doesn't make sense, but yet I do it every single week. And the worst part is, is then I like, like put a guy on my bench because I don't think he's going to perform well. And then he's always the guy that overperforms, but he's on my bench. And I need him to win, and so that's why I'm a loser and other people I play against are winners. That's called fantasy football. And every time I open that roster up, I think this thing is hopeless. There's no hope. There's no place for me in this area. And here we start the Advent season, and we're talking about hope. We're talking about life. We're talking about these great things and Jesus and all he's done. And I think we, we, we commonly... Just as I open up that roster, you're taking stock of your life and you're thinking, there's no hope here. There's nothing good here. There's nothing for me. It, 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 it's not exciting. It, 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 it's, there's no happiness. My kids don't like me or my job's not good enough. I'm not far enough in my career. We begin to go so negative and inward and difficult. And I want you to know that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. It's exactly what the opposite, that the devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy the hope that's in your life. But Jesus is here to give you hope in this season. No matter where you have hopeless, as silly it is to talk about fantasy football, there's real realities in your life that you're like, there's no hope in this area. No, no, no. There always is hope because Jesus is here. There's always hope because of this season. Jesus was born. He was brought to this earth by God. He was sent that Emmanuel, God with us, so that we would have hope for our lives. And in this Christmas season, we start a new series called Hope Named Jesus. Hope Named Jesus. The significance of light of God's promises in dark times. The world seems dark, because it is. But because of his light, light will always win. Because of God's presence, light will always win. So let's take four Sundays, including Christmas Eve, and let's look at the hope of Jesus for each of our lives. And really, let's get ourselves ready to invite others. I mean, this Christmas season is just such a great moment to be able to invite people you know that you're around, that you spend time with, that you live next door to, and invite them to church. But more than anything, I don't want to tell you to invite. I want to show you how to invite. Here's an example of a text that I send out all the time. Typically, I add the graphic along with it to Christmas Eve. And it's going to say something like this. It's going to say, like, I hope you are well, because you never want to text somebody and like, ask them how they're doing. <laughs> Immediately, it's like a sales pitch. And it depends on who I'm texting. Typically, I have two texts written out, older crowd, younger crowd. The younger crowd, it wouldn't say, hope you're doing well. I'd say, like, yo, exclamation. Even though I don't say yo, <laughs> I would probably put yo in the beginning of this. You're like, I've gotten this text from Kyle. And mine said, I hope you're well. Kyle thinks I'm old. <laughs> I hope you're well. It's the Christmas season, FYI. Shocker. And our church, I probably would put View Church, has three services. I'm going to name the times, the date, the location, 
And I'd love for you to be at one of them. I'd love for you to come with me. I, I'd love for your family to show up. We're going to, another thing to add, be like, we're going to this service. Would you and your family, would you want to come with us? Church can be so scary, even though it's a place of hope. It can be so scary. So go with people. Maybe you do this. Maybe they can only go to Saturday night and you want to go Sunday morning. Do this thing called inconvenience yourself. It's wild to think about, but you're the saved one. They're not. I know, lo- asking a lot here. You might even ask, like, why, though? Why, 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 would, I, why would I invite someone to church? Why, why, would I, why would I stress myself out? Why would I give myself anxiety in, in, on purpose? Let me tell you. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Know on your light, on your life, you're the light of the world. You are the light walking around because you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, going out. So be light. Don't be a hoarder of light. Be a dealer of light. Let everybody know about the light that you are living for. Because hope entered into a dark and silent world over 2,000 years ago. And his name is Jesus. And I, I want to teach a message to start off this series as we get ready for Christmas Eve. I want to teach a message t- titled this. It's a boy. Everybody say, it's a boy. It's a boy. Oh, my word. We should have changed the graphic to blue. Luke chapter 1, verses 28 through 35, and then verse 38. Luke chapter 1. Verses 28 through 35. Reads, that, reads this. It says, Gabriel appeared to her, her being Mary, and said, Greetings, favored woman. What a great sentence. Even though she's young, Gabriel should have started off with like, Yo, Mary, what up? <laughs> Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think, Uh, what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give, give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Verse 34. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born, uh, so the baby uh, to be born will be holy. And he will be called the Son of God. In verse 38, Mary has the greatest reply that really all of us should have whenever God speaks to us. She says, I'm not old enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not mature enough. What will I do? How will I explain it to others? No, Mary doesn't open up with excuses. Mary says this line, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Christmas season where we get to celebrate and remember the birth and the coming of Jesus, the arrival, the first entry of Jesus. As we anticipate his return someday, let's celebrate his entry. May we point as many people to you as possible, Jesus. May we fall more and more in love with you, and may we grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, we all said together, Can I get a louder amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The first thing I want to talk about in this story is this, the big announcement. Oh, I love an announcement. I love it when people get excited, but I find people these days, you know what I'm talking about, are a bit exhausting in their announcements. I don't got time for all of your announcements. I need one announcement. It's a boy. Have you seen these people with gender reveals? 
Have you, have you seen these people who think we have time enough to say that we're pregnant, that, that this is what the gender's going to be in 14 days? We're going to let you know because we found out. Have you seen these people who build anticipation as if I'm scrolling social media waiting for them to reveal to me what kind of baby they're having? Most likely, I'm going to forget that they're pregnant to begin with. Most likely, I'm going to forget the kid's name. And most likely, I'm going to dedicate the kid. I love the kid, but just let me know when it's coming, what its name is, and what gender it is. Amen? Amen. It's this long time. Remember when we got pregnant? Mm -hmm. Simpler times. You called mom and dad. That's it. There wasn't a photo shoot. There was a, oh, shoot. I said, I was all, we were like, well, buckle up. Do you feel ready? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Who cares how you feel? You're having a kid, nine months, and then they tell you it's actually ten months. And then you're as the guy like, what? And then you hear the heartbeat for the first time, and you're like, that's not a heartbeat. That's a wah, 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 wah. It's a boy. It's all I need. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. You will conceive and give birth to a son. One of the most impactful sentences in all of Scripture. This teen, this teenage virgin. This is difficult to process. There's two types of announcements, though. There's good ones, and there's bad ones. But as I've found, having an 11-year-old son, there's a third option now. And it's called mid he said that to me the other day. I said, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, well, it's in the middle. I could just say that next time then. And he said, bet. And I was like, I'm more confused. <laughs> but think about the joy of an angel speaking to you, the terror of an angel speaking to you, the joy of finding out that you're pregnant, the terror of remembering that you're a virgin engaged. The joy of, uh, of God calling to you and the terror of this moment. There's got to be such a sheer level of excitement, but also a lot of questions. I think rarely the times that we're being used and called on by God is there just complete confidence in your life going, yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm in, whatever, like I'll, I'll do anything. But then he calls something so big and so grandiose and so difficult that like, I, I probably like have an argument. I probably have some questions. I'd probably be like, but what about these other people? But that's not what Mary does. That's not the conversation. That's not what Gabriel gives her. That's not what God speaks to her life. He just gives her this, this moment. And a lot of well-meaning Christians with bad theology say things like God will only give you what you can handle. A lot of well-meaning Christians with a lot of bad theology, it's a good motto, it's not a moment in Scripture, say things like God will only give you what you can handle. What are you talking about? Do you read your Bible? <laughs> Have you met Moses? Moses didn't walk up to Pharaoh and go, God said I could do it. This is everything's going to be okay. Moses complained. Moses groaned. Moses said, I can't speak. Moses said, I can't do these things. Moses said, he's the king. I've already been there once. I've already committed murder. And God said, you can because I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He hands the staff over to Joshua at the end of his life. And Joshua goes through and he'll go, he, he says, I will be with you as I was with Moses and I will lead you as I led Moses. But Joshua's like, I don't want to do this. And God says, I know you don't, but with me, all things are possible. They didn't have a moment where they're like, say less. I'm good. I'm in. Yeah, whatever. This sounds so good. They have moments of terror. Tiny David against giant Goliath. He doesn't come to him and say, uh, uh, you, you know what, I'm, I'm bigger than you. He comes to him and says, my God's bigger than you. See, when you feel like you're being crushed by this world, know that God's given you the strength to kill this world, to be able to dominate this world, because it's all about light, and light always defeats darkness. He's not worried. He's not confused. When Jesus says, feed the 5,000, the disciples find all the excuses in the book, God says, no, 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 I told you to do it. And so they begin to do it. See, I think so often we find ourselves excuse-based instead of God-based. 
We find ourselves with all the good reasons and all the well-meaning reasons in our life. See, Scripture is filled with stories of people in divinely ordained situations that surely they couldn't handle. When you pick up the Bible, you're not reading stories of capable, self-assured individuals who are ready for whatever life brings them. The Bible is not uh, uh, about people being given what they can handle and the extra strong getting the extra difficult circumstances because they're the ones who can handle more. That's not what Scripture has for us. But somehow along the way, a ridiculous sentence like God will only give you what you can handle started in our vernacular and we found it to be true when it's inaccurate. That's not Scripture. Not only is it not true, but it's also an idea It's also an idea that could be damaging, could be hurtful. You could walk away from the faith because of sentences like that. If we only think God gives us what we can handle, what we do when we were in that situation and it seems impossible to bear is really important. The gospel isn't a message of self-sufficiency. The gospel is a message of self-insufficiency. Because he's the sufficient one. He's the one that provides. He's the one that gives. He's the one that's for us. He's the one that's with us. He's the one that gives us the strength. We need Jesus not only to rescue us from our sins, but also to walk us through the most difficult, overwhelming battles of our life. That's what this story is about. It's because she found favor. The story tells us Mary found favor with God. She was, living, she, was, she was living a holy and set-apart life. Sound foreign. But she didn't act like the world, and God said, I picked this one because of her character, because of her integrity, and because of her faith. God saw that she had the character, the integrity, and the faith to handle the challenge. Big announcement, God's people. Big announcement. How do you find favor with God? Be kind, love God, love your neighbor, treat people well, read your Bible, tithe, fast. That's just an exhaustive list of things that we think that we're supposed to do. but there's one thing on it. Do you put God first? Do you fear God? Do you revere God? Is he number one in your life? And when he is number one, you'll find favor to do mighty works for him. He'll pick you because the story is wild enough for any sane person just to walk away from the angel Gabriel speaking to God Mary. No one would have blamed Mary if she would have gotten that word and been like, no, I'm good. But God always has a plan. God always has a plan. The um, I'm not a I'm not a runner, but I run. Anybody else? Like I'm not a runner. Like I, not a part of that community. But I like I get out there and I pound pavement from time to time. Not not one of them, but I'm around them sometimes. And they're a they're a weird group of people. Runners. Shorts are real short. A lot of alone time. A lot of focus. A lot of dedication. So I'm not one of them, but I'm like around them enough. And I remember when I, when I ran my, uh, this isn't a flex, but do it if it what you will. When I ran my first half marathon, so by the time I hit double digits, no big deal. Um, I remember one of the first times I ever finished, I thought to myself, I was with some buddies who are a part of that running community, not me. I thought, that sound, that we finished, and I like, you know, if you've ever done something like that, you finish like this. And, and I remember going across that line, and, and, and they're like, I was like, I can't imagine doing that again. Like, we did half of a marathon. Why, don't even celebrate us. Like, I finished half a sandwich. Calm down. Like, like, let's not celebrate it too much. Like, I watched half a movie. I ran half a marathon. Don't, don't put the sticker on your car. And, and so, like, I did half of it. And I was like, I couldn't imagine doing that again. And they go, well, yeah, you didn't train for that. You trained for this many miles, but they trained for that many. 
See, what you train for, you'll be prepared to run. What you train for, you'll be prepared to run. If you train to just show up to church every week and not be a Christian the rest of the week, that's what you'll be. If you train to be holy and set apart, if you train to follow God and everything, if you train to put him first in every area of your life, you begin to act that way. If you train, if you renew your mind, if you begin to follow him in everything you have, you will have, of course you can't run a full marathon. You didn't train for it. See, what you train for, you'll be able to do, and it's what you'll produce. I mean, it's not accidental faith. It's not accidental character. It's not accidental integrity. It's moment after moment after moment after moment. God knows what he's doing and who he's doing it with. God knows what he's doing. God's plan. Drake voice. God, like, he knows what he's doing, and he knows who he's doing it with. God doesn't have a mystery sheet of plans waiting to dish them out to defeat the enemy. He, he, he doesn't have a cookbook that he pulls out and goes, oh, gosh, the, the, that's the special pumpkin pie recipe. No, no, no. He's got the Old Testament, and it's fulfilled in the New Testament and through our lives. It's not a new plan. It's the same plan. Mary wasn't a new idea. A virgin wasn't a new idea. This teenage girl wasn't a new idea. It was the story 700 years ago in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin. Like Mary didn't know the story, and Mary didn't know the Torah, and Mary didn't know what, what Isaiah said, and Mary didn't have this in her heart, and people around them didn't know. They knew, they just didn't like the story. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when you read Luke chapter 1, verse 34, we're not seeing shock and awe. We're seeing God's plan. We're seeing that he always had this moment. He always had divinity. He always is divine. He always knows his plan, and he's always going to fulfill it. His plan was always to use you. His plan was always for you to live right now. It's not shock. It's not awe. You don't need to look at the world and go, wow, what's going on? Say, wow, what can I do? See, too many people are obsessed with the darkness and not obsessed with the light. Too obsessed with what's going on in politics, too obsessed with what's going on in, around the world and wars, and, all, and we're so, we get so fixated on it. See, the great distraction is the great enemy getting you to focus on darkness instead of light. He is one of victory. I don't want to talk about what I'm for, uh, against. I want to talk about what I'm for. I don't want to live my life, oh, I'm against these things. I want to live my life, I'm for these things. I'm for the kingdom of God. I'm for God living in my life. I'm for this story. I'm for the hope of Jesus and the light that he is. When Mary asked the angel, but how, good question, can this happen, elephant in the room? I'm a virgin. What? I think it's part of the story that we just skip over it has a naughty word in it. It has mystery in it. You know what it has in it? Why we need to lean into it? Because it has miracle. I don't want to lean away from miracles. I want to lean into the miraculous. I want to go, well, he did, he did what? Man, he can do that. What he can do for my depression. He can do that. Look, look what he can do for this marriage. Look what he can do for this job. Look what he can do for these finances. Look, he, he can do, I, I didn't know he did that. Now that I know the, what I'm for, oh my word, watch it be lived out in my life. It's like this. Uh, you ever wake up in the middle of the night and your room's dark? And you're in a new room? You do this? You're just looking for that light switch. You're just trying to go to the bathroom because you're over the age of 50 and wake up three times in the middle of the night. You're just hoping to be able to find it. When you don't know a new space, you're just like, oh, my word, please. Oh, and you always hit your toe. And if you're the guy, heaven forbid you make a sound because your wife will. But if she did it, she can make as much sound as she wants. But when you turn that light on, oh, that was way off. How <laughs> did I get across the room? Like, what's going on? 
You discover where you are. See, salvation is just turning lights on in your life. It's realizing how close to the cliff you were. It's realizing the, the damaging relationships that you were, that you were in. It's realizing the, 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 the blindness to your eyes and opening up, lifting your chin, going, whoa, look at this world. It's glorious. It's amazing. Look what God has for me. See, because when you're looking for light in the middle of the night, you're anticipating light. When Jesus came to this earth, it was after four 400 years of silence, 700 years after God spoke this in Isaiah. That's a couple years, you guys. That's 4,000 years after the world's been created. That I'm pretty sure that even Adam and Eve, I'm pretty sure even Adam and Eve were like, I bet you one of our children will be the one, the son, who comes and redeems the world. But thousands of years go by waiting for light. And when he does, it changes everything. See, just because you're waiting doesn't mean God isn't coming. Just because you're waiting doesn't mean hope just isn't around. I don't encourage you to invite and show you how to do it on the big screen so we can fill a building. I do that because there's people in your life who need light. You, you might think they've got life figured out. Let me tell you this. They're desperate to get out of where they are. They are desperate for light in their life. Think about your life when you were in darkness. M Mary does this thing that is unbelievable to me because Mary's yes changed the world. <sighs> Don't get too familiar. Mary's yes changed the world. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Mary responded. She's already asked her one question. Good question. Now she's with her response. I, I'm the Lord's. I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you just said, because it's going to really help my, um, my reputation, uh, may everything you just said come true, <laughs> right? Like, hey, um, give me really cool if everything you just told me comes true. I'm going to really need that, Gabriel. Can you confirm that with God? Thank you. But when God asked anything of us, when God asked anything of us, is our response, is my response, is your response, I'm the Lord's. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, whatever, it, I'm, I'm the Lord's. But or is your life yours? I want to be more like Mary. Am I the Lord's or am I mine? Without hesitation, teenage Mary. There's three things that I notice from Mary as we close. Mary put service over status. Man. Sit with that. She was already willing to serve. She was prepared to serve. And they gave her the, the biggest task possible. That her status goes, her credibility. She had to run off and go spend a couple months with her cousin. She gave up her status. Are we willing to give up our status, friend groups, people around us, to be able to put God first in our lives? May we put service over status. May we put character over comfort. Mary put character over comfort. Think how often in my life I put comfort over character. Who you are behind closed doors matters more than who you are in open rooms. I know a lot of comfortable Christians with low character in the name of Jesus. Nothing about the story is comfortable, but it ushers in the comforter. Nothing about the story is comfortable, 
but it ushers in the one who brings comfort to our lives. Third thing I noticed from this is this. Mary put we over me. Mary put we over me. I want to be a we person. I want to be a we person. I don't want, God, God, can you remove the me, the me focus, the me centric, the me areas of my, I want to put we as a focus of my life. So God, when you speak to me, can I think about how does it impact we? How does it impact everybody that I'm around? It's a holistic approach. Because it's not all about you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. <laughs> that sometimes the Bible make you just, what? Why, how did that make it? It, uh, it says do nothing. Glasses off, same verse. Rather in humility value others above... <laughs> Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You want to know why people don't follow God and put him first? Buckle up. That's what scripture says. That, that's the story of the gospel. That's the mission. That's the message. You want to know why there's a lot of comfortable Christians in this world? Why Do that. Where they just, no, it's not, no, 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 no. I'm good. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to show up. I'm going to give my, my shekels and done. It's not the calling. Jesus, we're reading his story of his entry. And it's the story of his 33 years and his death and resurrection that just changed everything. But without Mary's yes. Without Mary's yes, we don't get Jesus. We need to be, yes, people willing to be used by God. Yes, people who are like, what, whatever you want. People around you are going to go, oh, you could make more money here. Pfft, I don't care. You could, do, you could do so much more. What about your time? I, I don't care. I'm here and I'm all about Jesus all about his mission. I'm all about his purpose. I'm all about his church. I'm all about people knowing Jesus, everything I do.